Here, let's watch this video. Riot's MMO video. I said I was gonna watch this after, after the Winter Grass testing, let's do it. In the past, MMOs were regarded as the godfathers of games. They were the peak of what developers could accomplish. Even though, looking back, that's a fairly subjective thing to say. Everyone knew MMOs had the power to create cult following. But also, everyone knew making MMOs was hard. On average, an MMO has to spend at least six years in the baking before it can get anywhere near being good. But that didn't stop companies from jumping onto the bandwagon anyway. And soon we could see dozens of new MMOs, all releasing in 2008. All being called the WoW Killers. Spoiler alert, none of them did that. And unfortunately, we can feel the ripple effects even now. It got to a point where every time a new MMO is announced, we all think the same thing. Oh. Anyway, when you're working on an MMO, you have to respect three pillars. Dude, that's the one thing I think that, that uh, a lot of MMOs did wrong over the years. One thing that a lot of MMOs did wrong over the years is that they, they all tried to be WoW killers. Because WoW, WoW was king. WoW, WoW was the guy for, for years and years and years. And, and what happened is when, when you come out and you're trying to do the same thing that, that another company is doing, it's just not going to work. You, you have to make your own game. You know, it's, it's, if you're just copying everything outright, it's very, very, like, you'd have to completely blow it out of the water to, to be able to truly compete with it. So many games came out. I mean, chat, you guys name them yourselves. Like, Rift, Conan Exiles, right? Uh, was it Conan Exiles or, or, or Age of Conan? What was the game called? It was Age of Conan, wasn't it? Wildstar. A lot of people had a lot of good things to say about Wildstar. Um, but that, that's like a different discussion, right? Uh, tons of them, tons of them. Aeon, but what was the, there was one with like a, um, Dark Age of Camelot is still my favorite MMO ever. I was a big Dark Age of Camelot guy. I loved Dark Age of Camelot and the systems in that game are phenomenal. I wasn't super good at it, I just loved it. Gameplay is king, social interactions matter, and the world setting is important. When Riot announced their MMO, it became clear that two of the pillars are being respected and the third one, is already done. When it comes to the gameplay, it is currently in the hands of Ghostcrawler, someone who's been working on WoW. Ghostcrawler, frick this guy. If you're a paladin in original Burning Crusade, then like this is the guy that he would always like shit on paladins and people hated him. Bring its best times and someone who got a reputation for hating boomkins and loving mages. When it comes to the social interactions, it is a dance between the developers and the players. A dev can guide players towards social interactions or they can annihilate them. And after that, the players usually find their own fun inside the MMO. From that point on, the devs should do everything in their power to support the players having fun in their own way. And finally, when it comes to the world of an MMO, in Riot's case, it's done. And it's been finished for quite a few years now. In fact, the world of Riot's MMO is in such a good state, they already have the continents, the zones, the cultures and the races. And to a lesser degree, every zone already has its own storyline. Or of League of Legends, you wouldn't know about this. And that's why I decided to make this video. I want to show you all the zones we are going to see in the MMO and what sorts of quests we are going to do there. So, for the purpose of this video, I will assume you have no idea what League of Legends is about. You have no idea what the universe is about, but you like MMOs, your hairline is receding, and you have a crippling fear of Nintendo 64 controllers. To which I might add, why do you think I'm wearing hats? But now, without further ado, let's have a look at all the zones in Riot's MMO. This is Rune Terra, the world of League of Legends. Right now, the world is separated into 10 main regions. But these 10 regions don't cover all the land on the map, so there are some mini-zones in between them. And the lore already revealed that there is gonna be another continent further to the east. That definitely sounds like a future expansion to me. In fact, it would be foolish to release all of these regions at launch. You can easily turn half of these into separate expansions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's similar to what WoW did, right? Uh, now, what's, what's interesting about this is, uh, so what he's doing, I guess, is, is showing the world of, of, of League of Legends, which is Runeterra, and uh, explaining, like, how it's going to fit in, like, the MMO atmosphere or, or whatever, the MMO, like, ecosystem. 
I, I mean, I, I haven't seen this video yet. Everybody's talking about this video saying it's really good. I can, I can already see why this is going to be good and super interesting because if you played Warcraft 2 or Warcraft 3, I mean, if you played the Warcraft RTS games prior to World of Warcraft coming out, that's basically what they did. I mean, they, they had the original world with, with, with the Eastern Kingdoms and with uh, Kalimdor. Like, all this stuff existed in World of Warcraft, sorry, in Warcraft. There was a world in Warcraft and uh, they wanted to take that, and they literally named the game after it. And uh, they changed some things. Like, if you look at, like, the original, like, WoW or Warcraft world and zones, and you look at old maps, they're not 100% one-to-one accurate because they changed some things for the sake of gameplay, I'm sure, and world design, level design, that kind of stuff. But uh, the general idea of what it is is pretty freaking sick, right? And that's pretty cool. And because a lot of people already know and love these regions, the hype behind these expansions would be big. With that said, I know a lot of you would like to play as Shremans or Ionians. And now you may be cursing me for suggesting that these would be expansions. But the lore can justify giving you these nations as playable races without having their regions. I'll show you how Riot can pull this off in a bit. First, let's talk about the regions Riot's MMO has to start with the Northern Continent. This entire continent is called Valoran. Not Valorant, Valoran. And this is where the absolute core of this world is. The two main regions here are Demacia and Noxus. They are the two big rivals equivalent to the Horde and the Alliance. Yeah. While I would like to say that Demacia is your classic normie human region, it's not really true. Runeterra doesn't really have a normal place. There is something cool happening in every region. And Demacia... Demacia! racism. Okay, maybe not racism, because Demacia doesn't mind Yordles or Minotaurs, but they really hate mages. That's because in the past, their rivals almost annihilated They're half of the world using magic. And so Demacia was built inside a magic-absorbing forest. Therefore, Demacia is a really cool place where you can hide from magic. When it comes to the visuals of the zone, you can see a lot of lush fields, it is surrounded by mountains, but the iconic part of Demacia are the buildings. They are made of petricite, which is a combination of stone and the magic-absorbing wood. Because these ancient magic-absorbing trees were grey, all the buildings have a marble-like appearance. And yes, given what material they are using, all the buildings in Demacia also absorb magic. So should a mage visit this region, let's just say it's gonna be a painful experience. Wait, so isn't Lux a mage? This, let's not forget that Demacians can weaponize Petricite. They can turn it into Petricite steel, which gives you your classic anti-magic weapons, and you can sculpt Petricite constructs, which wake up after absorbing magic. Simply said, these guys just really don't like magic. The irony is, they've been absorbing it for years now. And this is where the story would kick in. You see, the Marcians are so afraid of magic, they founded the Mage Seeker Order. This is an order of people who hunt mages, they throw them in the prison, and they torture them until their body gives up on magic. So yes, being a mage is a crime in the Masia. The thing is, people still get naturally born with magical abilities. You can't stop it from happening. So not only are there mages hiding in the royal court, right now there is a mage civil war happening in Demacia, where mages and people who don't hate mages rise up to fight for moral rights. So should we do some quests in this zone? This is gonna be the core story. Mages trying to overthrow racist leadership following old laws. So the main enemy NPCs might be mages and witches. But I know what you're thinking now. And don't worry, there will be plenty of boars to kill here too. Or at least there are loads of wolves here, as well as stags. And we can't forget the iconic Demacian raptors. But further to the south, we might find some crag beasts, tiny woolly elephants, and yes, of course in the Argent Mountains there are also dragons. Loads and loads of dragons. But that's about it for Demacia. You know what's so interesting to me? is, and this is probably what Riot said themselves, they have this whole, like, backstory and lore and world. Now, I, I don't know if the lore of, of League of Legends is quite as robust as the lore of Warcraft, like the old lore of Warcraft, but in a lot of ways, like, the world and stuff is already, like, it, it is already hashed out. 
the game is kind of primed for a, a pretty strong, like, has a pretty strong base for an MMO. And that's probably what Riot said when they were like, you know what, maybe we can make an MMO out of this. Like, I don't, I don't think the lore is quite as deep as the original Warcraft lore was. Because I feel like League of Legends is one of those games that is, it's not a storytelling game, it's, it's a gameplay game. So it's not, like, embedded deeply into the player of, like, what's happening in the storyline and the history of the game. Because, like, Warcraft 2, Warcraft 3, like, the, the Warcraft games, like, you play through story mode and it te it's, it's telling you a story of, of what all is going on. So I don't think it's as deep, right? But it is kind of primed to have, like, th there's a pretty good canvas there. A fun fact, the capital city of Demacia is called the Great City of Demacia. Sounds dumb, but Runeterra was not the first one to come up with this. But thankfully, the other regions are a bit more creative with their names. So now, let's move away from the Normie region and let's have a look at the badass region, Noxus. If you're planning tons on of playing League. a warrior... So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying here is, is it's, it's not as like, uh, like if you just play the game, that's not really like as apparent to you. You know what I mean? Like the, that's like all, like all side content. Whereas if you just played Warcraft 1, 2, 3, then a lot of the, like, the story of... of Illidan and Kael'thas and Vosh and Arthas, like all these things was like, it was presented to you like on a silver platter. Whereas, whereas with this stuff, it's like, oh, after the fact, like they made Arcane, they made like, they're like, they're adding to it and they're building it around the game as opposed to building it as part of the game. So what I'm saying is, is the, the canvas is, is, is there. Like, I don't think it's like as, as deeply embedded. With oversized weapons so. and overcompensating lush hair, this is the region for you. This place actually has a long and badass history, but we really don't have the time to explain it now. So just know that originally it was built by the most badass warrior in the history of Runeterra. This motherfucker literally died on a mountain of corpses. And after he died, he was too angry to stay dead, so he just became the god of the underworld. When this guy lived, he built the Immortal Bastion which is, to this day, the largest structure on the entirety of Runeterra. And I hate he is dude. banished underneath the Immortal Bastion, but only a few people know about it. So, you know, that's a future raid boss. Anyway, the Immortal Bastion is the capital city of the Noxian Empire, with Noxus being one of the most brutal nations in Runeterra. It is brutal because the nation is surrounded by rocky earth. It is hard to grow plants here. So Noxians are forced into conquering surrounding land for resources to survive. That's why when you go to the map, you can notice that the Noxian territory is Let all actually over play a little bit of League today. It's because these are all the places Noxus has already conquered. Although, when I say it like that, you may imagine Noxus brutally raiding everything. But that's not true. They like to absorb the surrounding nations into their empire. I want to try all, new, new it's just more human resources. Most of the time, they only remove the royalty and they let the leaderless people join their empire. And rulers tend to not be good fighters. This is what you can see in the After Victory cinematic. They killed the king because he was weak and let everyone else join them. Fun fact, conquering nations is so iconic for Noxus, they have their own saying. Kill them punk, punk. until they are family. <laughs> so, Kill them, pong pong. To the quests in Noxus, it is most likely going to be helping the Empire expand its territory. Although, this region has its own unique enemies too. Inside the Immortal Bastion, there is a cult known as the Black Rose. This cult is connected to the darkest of magics. So be ready to fight Hemomancers, witches, demons, Hemomancers, and the Grey Legion which is an army of soldiers revived with blood magic to fight for the Empire again. And when it comes to collecting 10 bear asses, here we have the native Drakehounds and Basilisks. Now, while Noxus and Demacia are the main rivals here, both of them are also constantly repelling raids from the north. So now, let's have a look at the Freljord. Just like pretty much any region on Runeterra, Freljord has a long history. But for the purpose of this video, just know that the maddening old gods known as the Watchers of the Void, who want to devour the entire reality only because it keeps waking them up, once tried to breach into reality here. They almost succeeded because they tricked the Ice Witch Lysandra into helping them. Fortunately, she realized how wrong she was, and she managed to freeze half of the kingdom with the Watchers still beneath them. 
So these days, the Ice Witch is the only person holding back the end of reality by keeping the Watchers frozen. So at some point in the future, you bet one of these woken up frozen Watchers is gonna be a raid boss. Now, yeah, when it maybe. comes to the NPCs, this is... Dude, it's kind of cool to think about all this stuff, man. Like, I, I, right now, what's kind of going through my head... I, I'm looking at the, the, the factions here, right? You have Noxus, you have uh, Demacia, you have Piltover and Zon... Like... You have all this. I guess these are, are these these are cities, right? These aren't actually factions, uh, but I guess they kind of are. I wonder, is this game going to be a two faction MMO or maybe like a, even like a three faction MMO? The city states. Yeah, 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 that's better. No factions. You think you think it'll be no factions at all? I love the three faction system of Dark Age of Camelot. I I, I love it. So I, I think this is something that I, is, is very intriguing to me is if there's going to be more than two factions. I think two factions is fine. Like if they go with the base of like Demacia and Noxus and what, what would that be? Like, for example, Demacia and Ionia might be together and Noxus, Bilgewater would be like, you know what I mean? But I think, I think if you have multiple factions, it could be kind of sick. Like a, like a three faction system could be kind of sick. This is where things get diverse. First of all, remember that the Freljord is brutally cruel. Everything is frozen, and survival is everything. So the first enemy here would be the wildlife. From Rhymefangs to Yetis to Druvasks to Elnex to Mammoths to the worst of them all, Poros. Next we are going to fight the Fraliordians themselves. There are three main tribes here. The Avarosans, who are quite peaceful, the Wintersclaw, who are quite brutal, and the Frostguard, Lysandra's followers who hold back the Watchers. And let me tell you, these guys have some badass armor. Among the notable tribes, there are also the Ursine, which are shamans who worship the Volibear, the primal god of the wild who slowly turns Adding his factions with an expansion? Into oh, I think that'd be bad. Monstrosities. Speaking of which, yes, there are also the primal gods of Freljord. And finally, we need to talk about the Iceborne. When the Watchers tried to arrive here, they tainted the ice around them. This special ice is called the true ice, and it is so dangerous you literally die if you touch it. However, the Watchers also tainted some people, giving them the ability to touch the ice. It is still extremely painful for them to hold a true ice weapon, but at least they can survive it. These people are known as the Iceborn. But people were not the only things that were tainted. There are also ice trolls some of whom are also Iceborn. To be honest, these guys were made to have their own dungeon. But there are also some animals that were twisted by the Watchers. And Lysandra is even twisting some beings herself to make them serve her. So overall, Freljord is gonna have a lot of cool warriors, shamans and horrors. So these would be the three regions on the main continent. But this place is actually so big, it can easily make the base world of the game. Especially since there are a bunch of smaller regions in between them. There is Nokmerge, full of witches, Argent Mountains with their dragons, Tokugol with void monsters, Dalamore Plains with him, and so much more. But from here, you can cleverly set up the expansions because of how well everything is interconnected. So now, let's have a look at the continent to the east called Ionia. Ionia has a very close connection to Noxus. You can only guess why. It's because Noxians once tried to conquer it all during oh, an Ionia is with Noxus, the then? invasion okay. of Ionia. This was a horrible war full of using children as soldiers because Noxians thought Ionians wouldn't fight back against children. And chemical weapons. Lots and lots no? of chemical okay, they're weapons. Against them. Okay, that's what I thought. Speaking of which, remember Singed from Arcane? It's a, he, when he said close, he said close relationship, and I was like, wait, He's the, the guy who chemically devastated Ionia. Eventually, Noxus failed, but they kept their small controlled territories. So the first quest here could be simply boarding a ship, sailing over, and exploring the place for the Noxian Empire. Now, when it comes to Ionia itself, the place If gets you are mystical. hearing this, Every wake up. You have been in a coma for seven years, your family misses you. This reality is false. You must wake up. This is our last attempt. Thing here is alive and connected to the spirit of nature. 
And I mean everything, from the animals to the people to the buildings. Everything is alive. So if you anger Mother Nature, your house can twist and strangle you in your sleep. So you can only imagine how Mother Nature fought against Noxians. Usually a river came alive to drown them. That's why all the buildings here look like they were woven from wood. It's because they were. With nature magic, people let nature build their houses. It also means that sometimes your house can just walk away. When it comes to the NPCs here, obviously there is gonna be a lot of nature spirits. And a lot more of simply mystical animals. From giant flying tigers to the never-ending story. But be ready to also face local Ionians, blade masters, shadow cultists, murderers and ninjas. Both good, bad and the in-between. But finally, there is also one more enemy that we could face. The furries. That's right, this race is known as the Vastaya. They are half humans and half magical animals. And yes, canonically, the species was born in exactly the way you are thinking. But to be fair, the Vastaya are quite cool and they are definitely gonna be a playable race. Just like Yordles, who also like Ionia. Dude, I hope there's like a paladin-like race for like, Mother Nature, Demons started occupying all the places filled with misery and doubt. So that's gonna be a nice bonus enemy. So yes, the exploration of Ionia and the raid on the Shadow Order could be a really cool first expansion. But it's definitely not Riot's only option, because we can also go south to Piltover and Zorn. These are the ones people will know about, simply because this is where Arcane took place. Piltover and Zone are two massive cities located one above the I didn't other. watch Arcane. And they are so massive, they could easily be turned into their own playable zones. They are both focusing on futuristic technology powered up by magic of the Hextech gemstones. Using this magic, they can power up anything from guns to augmented limbs to vehicles. Visually, it is simply futuristic Victorian era. And unfortunately, there wouldn't be much of enemy variety. We would likely fight the rich houses of Piltover and their deadly assassins, with the occasional thief on the streets, corrupt wardens, and the occasional time, rogue steam golem. But things get a bit more interesting in the undercity known as Zone. Zone is the dirty underbelly covered in thick toxic smoke. Because the majority of people are poor here, they developed a cheaper alternative to Hextech called Chemtech. This artificial green stuff can power up cheaper limb replacements, as well as highly unstable weaponry. Zone is also controlled by the Cam Barons, which are obviously gonna be the main enemy here. But on the side, we may also meet some chemical mutants, unstable constructs, as well as some mass murderers and people who hunt down mass murderers. And funnily enough, at the very, very bottom of Zone itself... Uh, is this like steampunk? Is that what it's called? Like that sort of like, uh, like... The theme? very, very bottom of yeah. Zone itself, there are the hidden ruins of an ancient city full of traps. That is obviously gonna be a cool dungeon. So yes, there is not much more that I can add here. Built over and Zone were simply explored in Arcane. So if you like the series, you are gonna like this place. From here, we can travel further south to Shurima. Shurima used to be a massive empire that ruled the world. But after the emperor got betrayed by his best friend, the entire empire collapsed. This region is a massive desert with the occasional city near a river. In the center of the region, there is the Sun Disk, a colossal piece of star metal that has the power to reflect celestial magic. The Shurimans use this celestial magic to turn their best soldiers like into the Ascended, also known Dude, I hate Nasus so much. As the Golden God Warriors. I, I However, hate Nasus, these dude. God Warriors wouldn't make a great enemy here. That's because after the Emperor had died, the Ascended started fighting for leadership. Why? Slowly, dude, he's an AFK after champion, dude. learning how to use blood magic... They literally just AFKs. Edge, they morphed their own bodies and became the Darkin. Twisted, blood-frenzied monsters that would certainly make really cool raid bosses. Besides this ancient evil, Shurima is also full of its own animals, raiders, dune scavengers, and on top of all of that, void creatures. 
That's because to the south there used to be a kingdom known as Ikathia that wanted to destroy the Shuriman Empire. So no, Twitch isn't doing Thursday Night Football the only more. Watchers for help. You can imagine how that went. The Watchers sent through some Void Beasts that consumed Ikathia and polluted Shurima to this day. To fight back the Void, Shurima does have a lot of hidden tombs around with hidden God Warrior weapons. Not to mention that combo. Shurima also has a circle of Time Mages who are trying to freeze the Void in time. Now, as I mentioned near the beginning of the video, if Does her face kind of look like Bonnie's? Now, no. as I mentioned near the beginning of the video, even if Shuriman said it before I did, they can still easily make Shurimans a playable what race. That? Bonnie, that looks kind of like you. Connected to Noxus. As you can see, of course, Noxians already you guys don't see it? Shurima, so some Shurimans are fighting for Noxus. Also, as a cool fact for those of you who liked Arcane, Hex Crystals are harvested in Shurima. That's why a Shuriman expansion would be a great follow-up to Piltover and Zone. And again, that's why Riot can easily turn only the northern continent into the base world. Anyway, going west from Shurima, we arrive at Mount Darbo. I don't have face blindness. This place is incredibly unique. First of all, this mountain is not natural. It was literally pulled up from the ground by celestial gods. And that's because I'm this place I'm serves as a portal to the Red celestial Arena's realm, Arena. also known as Targon Prime. Now, because this mountain was pulled up, it also has some unique features. For example, you may find frozen lakes frozen horizontally on the mountain. And the very peak of the mountain is special too. Should a mortal reach the peak despite the brutal climate and the deadly wildlife, either they die from exhaustion, or the celestial gods deem them worthy and they become an ascended aspect. There is aspect of war, aspect of the sun, aspect of the moon, aspect of the twilight, aspect of the guardian, and so on. Simply said, after people reach the peak, they become some of the strongest beings on the entire planet. And I speculate this is where we could get a lot of cool armor sets. I do think the armor from here does look kind of sick. I, I like the sun, the sun armor, like the gold, like that. I think it looks kind of sick. The aspect of I the, the sun. Good. Then there are the rivals, the Lunari, who are devoted to the aspect of the moon. But also the tribe, I assume, will become a playable class, the warriors of Rakor. Of course, besides just humans. Targon also has all sorts of furry uh, I was thinking about getting Near Kava. the bottom of the mountain, you may notice that the mountain is alive, but also there are stellar corns, a variety of mind-bending creatures, and loads and loads of dragons. Speaking of which, remember that this place is linked to the Celestial Realm. So this is where we may also meet the star-forging Celestial Dragon Aurelian Soul, as well as all sorts of Aurelian other Celestial soul. beings. A lot of these would make for interesting bosses. In fact, the ascension of Mount Targon would be a really cool raid. Next, on the other side of Shurima, there is Ishtal. This is a special Ishtal. place where people are mastering the elemental magic. They are using it for everything. Fishing, smithing, walking. And this place is definitely gonna be saved for an expansion. Basically, remember when Ikathian asked the Watchers for help? And then that happened? Ishtal was their neighbor, and after they saw the Void devour an entire kingdom, they believed the Void would soon devour the entire world. So, using their elemental magic, Ishtal built massive walls of plants around their entire region, isolating themselves from the rest of the world. For three and a half thousand years, Ishtal stayed isolated, believing that the world outside of their walls was devoured by the Void. But now, very recently, some mages found out that the world outside is completely fine. So now, it's Ishtal fine. mages are slowly revealing themselves. To be honest, Ishtal is the most underdeveloped region in Runeterra. We know the region has a lot of hunting Vastaya, deadly plants and some elemental Poison weapons, Ivy. but most of the region is still a mystery to us. So at least here, Riot will have the freedom to try something new. But now, that is that is kind of a good thing too. To visit the last two regions. That is that is actually but, something that's also good. I, I talked about how like there's very embedded things. I mean, you could always retcon something, right? But it's easier to retcon something whenever it's not like fully fleshed out, you know. First of all, there is Bilgewater. If you like pirate adventures, 
this is gonna be your place. This is where we are going to explore inns and gambling dens, even some local temples worshipping the god of motion, Nagake Boros. Here we are going to fight pirates and sea monsters, sea witches, sea vastaya, maybe some demons. And possibly we'll side with Sarah Fortune to fight the king of the pirates. Miss Gen Fortune. But there's a lot more here. Last year, Riot released their RPG, which was set in Bilgewater. So not only can we already explore this place in detail, but it even has a monster journal. And at monster a quick journal. glance, you can already see some Wait, what really is this? cool bosses too. However, this place is also linked to the last place I want to show you today. The Shadow Isles. See, every year the horrors of the Shadow Isles lurk out. And Bilgewater just happens to be the closest place. So every year, Bilgewater is fighting the Rune King RPG. Once I upon never a time, heard the about Shadow it. Isles used to be the Blessed Isles, a rich place full of advanced magic. Long story short, there was a young asshole king who wanted to revive his dead queen. And in the process, he accidentally released dark necromantic magic. This magic destroyed the island and made it home for undeath. In the lore, this event is called the Ruination. And because the RPG is called The Ruined King, it may not be a surprise to you that you also get to explore the Shadow Isles there. And there they have anything you the can Shadow imagine. Isles. Undead horrors creeping everywhere. And should we ever venture into these islands? I have no idea whom we're going to fight. The Ruined King who caused all of this is banished elsewhere. Thresh, who siphoned his magic after he was banished, also left the Isles. And even Hecarim, the most brutal soldier of them all, is currently around Demacia. So the Shadow Isles don't currently have a main baddie. So this is where Riot could push forward some of the side characters. Now, even though these have all been the regions that are currently set up on Runeterra, Riot has already confirmed that there is a new continent further to the east. Currently, it is planned to be revealed in the upcoming Ruination novel. And yeah, so like it's far, not. We know that this new continent is where the unique lurker clone. You're, you're right. Technically, it's not based on like facts. I mean, it kind of is, but it, this is speculation based on facts. It's not like the. It's not the truth about where the MMO is. I mean, it's a good video. I think it's a very good video. Diego is from, and this is also where he was banished at the end of his story. All we know about that place is that it is quite mystical. There are yet more dragons here, and in fact. Kamavor, which is the Ruined King's nation, has a lot of draconic armor. So should Riot run out of places to explore, don't worry, they can always make up more. But that's all I wanted to show you today. As someone who's been following the lore of League of Legends from the very beginning, I can tell you, I'm very confident the setting of Riot's MMO is gonna be great. Their incredible <laughs> writers have been preparing the world for years now, and now, it's time to harvest the fruit. If you like this video, let me know in the <laughs> Dude, comments he's below. Dude, standing at the because thing. Because right now, he's I standing still at the have podium. three more topics that I could talk about that was an in accident. regards to the MMO. I especially want to talk about the potential raid bosses we can face and the potential classes we could play. And as someone who has collected an unholy amount of transmog, I would love to show you all the cool armor sets this universe has. But that's it for this video. See you in six to eight years when the MMO gets released. True. I, I think it's cool to kind of see like how the world is laid out and the parallels between this and the original release of like Classic WoW and, and kind of having it, it being an MMO based off of another game. I, I think it's really cool. I do. And it allows you to kind of see what the, um, or kind of speculate what it could be. And I, and I think stuff like that's great. I, I, think, I think this is phenomenal. Great video. Fantastic video.